If you want to listen to this episode or any of our episodes ad-free, you can do that now. Head on over to Patreon. Click on the ad-free level. You get all of our bonus shows that you've been hearing so much about. Plus, every single day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, you can listen to this episode or any of our other episodes at the same time, ad-free, over on Patreon. Hey everyone, this is David. Welcome back behind the velvet rope. Let's just get right into it today because we are joined by the one, the only Miss Dana Wilkie. <laughs> Hi, David. What is going on today, Dana? How are you? I'm okay. I'm hanging in. I, I took my son to Washington, D.C. for five days. Mother, and, mother, son time. Yeah, mother, son time. And I also did some socializing with some friends there. And I'm feeling a little like burnt the candle at two ends kind of <laughs> today. Uh, I flew back last night at midnight. So I'm tired. I'm tired too. Well, you know, I don't know if you know this, but the first show of 2021 on Behind the Velvet Rope was you. You kicked off our banner year here, Miss Dana Wilkie. And then we've done guests on each other's Patreons. We had all your bells and all your whistles, no pun intended. We did YouTube lives together. We fallen asleep on YouTube live together. And now <laughs> here we are at the end of 2021 and you are back as like a real guest on Behind the Velvet Rope. Are you excited for your appearance back? Are you nervous? How, how do you I'm, I, I, you know what? I always want to give you my best performance. So tonight I'm feeling a little intimidated in that I'm tired and uh, groggy and I, I hate to answer questions like that, but I'm going to do my best for you, David. Cause you know, I, I like, I put my heart and soul in everything I do with you. You know that you do. And you don't seem tired to me. Well, listen, let's just get right into it. You know, you were on The Housewife and The Hustler. It was a huge ratings blockbuster. And in true TV fashion, now we have double that. And we are back with The Housewife and The Shaw Shocker. I wonder how long it took to come up with that name. <laughs> I actually was really funny because the producers all asked us, like, I think they probably asked everyone they interviewed, what would you call the show? And that wasn't my name, <laughs> but this, someone must have said it. Um, well, I like it, you know. Cool. Yeah. Cause I guess it's, you know, it's shaw shocking. <laughs> exactly. It is shaw shocking now. Okay. So before we get there, let's just, how, how did you get, well, you know what? Let's just talk for a few minutes about, um, about, you know, just for people that don't know all the details, like basically the overview, look at, I've had Gloria Allred here. I've had Lisa Bloom. We've had, I've had Emily Baker, lots of attorneys, but let's just keep it easy. So like basically Jen Sean, Stuart Smith, they were arrested. This is an overview for people. They were arrested around last March. They were charged with one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud in connection with telemarketing through which they allegedly victimized, yes, I'm reading, 10 or more people over 55, and one case of conspiracy to commit money laundering. And they both pled not guilty at an arraignment in April, and Stewart has since changed his plea in the past two weeks and to, to guilty, and Jen is claiming that she is innocent. And Stewart is going to be sentenced on March 3rd of 2022. And the max sentence could be 70 years for both of them and others that have been found guilty have served around five to seven years. So how's that for a brief overview, Dana? It was very good. If you want to know what Stuart plead guilty to in detail, I have a YouTube video on my new YouTube channel, Deca Dish Dana. <laughs> A new YouTube. Okay, so we have a whole new YouTube channel. Wow. You did a live with me. You knew that. Yeah, but I, but I didn't know that it was called that. Wow. 
Yeah, Deca Dish Dana. It's basically gossip videos that are very informational in like around 10 minutes. Wow, I love it. You Thank know. you. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Um, <laughs> well, let's start with this. How did you um, get involved with, how did you get involved with the housewife and the hustler to begin with? Like the Erica one? Like, I don't even know that. Like, how, how did this come about? So the producer that uh, did that show was uh, in my Patreon and she had, uh, I guess, heard about my podcast. And I do have quite a lot of journalists in my Patreon. I think they use it for sometimes story leads or, you know, maybe to get a gauge of like, you know, what the fans are thinking about stuff, you know, things like that. And so um, the producer of the House of and Hustler was a fan of Dishing Drama Dana, my podcast that you've been on many times with the sound effects and all that. And we have it also on your show, on your Patreon. And she, uh, I had done obviously a huge series on uh, Erica Jane Girardi. And she was aware that I had been the one who broke the fact that Erica Jane was getting divorced first. And so as a result of that, uh, you know, those, that culmination of things, she reached out to me and said, listen, I'm a fan of your podcast. I've been your patron since the beginning. Um, I know you broke the Erica story. I love how you've covered her so extensively, you know, in the patron. And I would love you to be on this show I'm producing for uh, Hulu. And they probably also love that you were an actual housewife quote-unquote friend of I mean that has to be a plus well I think there was when they were first brainstorming this I I I think you know as it when they were first brainstorming it they thought wow it's really cool that she would have the insight into what it would be like to be on the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills And she would also have an insight as being a reality uh, cast member. And then I'll add to that, that I broke the divorce story and I covered it so extensively in the Patreon. Um, You know, I'm not so sure that it didn't inspire to a certain degree. I'm sure they had some interest around it, but it's possible. And I haven't actually verified this with the producer who I'm still in touch with. But it's possible it inspired a little bit The Housewife and The Hustler, some of the show content I was doing because it was so early on. And as a result of that, it just sort of built from there. And then I do believe with like you love to say to me, shady David, just kidding. Um, No, I call you a gossip monger. I don't say shady. I say you're Dana the gossip monger. Okay, so David likes to throw some shade sometimes that all these women and housewives were asked. And I'm sure that that, evolved over time that they did that. And they were like, you know, they kind of saw that, you know, it would make the show more interesting or whatever, if they could get more and more people that were invested in the housewife franchise. But I do genuinely believe in the way that she approached me, that it was honest and that she really, truly, um, you know, uh, like came from a space that she was a fan of the show, not just trying to get me because I was on housewives. Okay. And I don't mean any shade. I was just, you know, just asking you now, here's my question. So you were involved in the housewife and the hustler, and now you're involved in, you know, the housewife and the Shaw shocker. Okay. So you're involved, you're hired, blah, blah, blah. What does one do? Like, what do you do then? You know what I mean? Like if I were hired for this, <laughs> I would, you know, like any interview I'd have to prepare, like, do you prepare? Do you do research? Listen, there's no shade in any of these questions, Dana. These are no, just it's a hundred percent. I actually just did uh, talked about this again. I did a quick live on my YouTube about this. And basically um, for both shows, the housewife and the hustler and the Shaw shocker, um, I put together about nine pages of notes based on a very general outline of topics uh, that they thought they might cover in the interview. And I, you know, essentially put all of these notes together and then I memorize them. So I actually take on average on these shows four days. I literally take four days off of work before I do the, whatever the shoot date is. And the first day I research, 
and I put my notes together. The second day I start to memorize them. The third day I finalize memorizing them and talk them through out loud. And then the fourth day I present on camera. So like when you present, do they, cause you know, like it's edited. We're like, like, do you like, do you just get certain questions or you just talk about everything and they just kind of piece it together? I talk about everything and then they cut it. I've gotten better at it. Um, I've learned, unfortunately for me, um, because I don't have a law degree, there's only so much they can use me for in a show like this because ABC has to have a certain level of comfort, even if I'm everything I'm saying is accurate, that like the right person is saying it. So like I, they've given me a huge, uh, you know, like, they've given me so much trust because they do sort of treat me like uh, certainly a reality star expert, but they treat me also like uh, kind of like an investigative journalist, which I know is a stretch, but you know, my work, you know what I do. And ABC has, has done that for me. They have allowed me uh, extended that uh, honor to me, you know, but when it gets into the legal, there's only so much they can actually use me for. And I love to comment on the legal so I die inside every time I do the four hour interview because I have so much to say about the legal part of it and they won't really let me comment too much. They're like, Dana, we can't do so much of this because it's going to end up with a lawyer saying it. You know what I mean? I do. So, yeah, uh, but they're really nice to me. Uh, they, you know, this just to tell you a private story. Um, I, they reached out to me to do the Shaw Shocker. And I said to them that I couldn't go to New York because of my son. He was like doing so many things and it was just too much to leave him. And I don't have like, you know, I don't have a nanny or any of that anymore. So it was like, I just was like, you guys, I want to do it so badly, but I can't go to New York you know, and I even said to my, on my Patreon, I told my listeners, you know, listen, I, I, I might've let you guys down because I know when you, you love when I go on these things, but like, I have to prioritize my son and, uh, ABC was like, let's see what we can do. And like within 24 hours, they called me back and was like, we're going to do, you know, we're going to rent your old house. Like the one from housewife and the hustler, <laughs> and we're going to send a production crew. We'll do everything there. And you know, we'll make it your shoot. And I just felt so good. It was so nice. I mean, it just felt That's so nice. nice. Yeah. So yeah. you prepare, you spend your four hours talking, like, were you excited to participate again? Like that's a, I mean, you are the only one from the first one that was in this one, right? That I, saw. yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. I was so excited to participate. I love it. I love it. I would, t I would do like one a week. <laughs> So <laughs> if they why, let me. why, so you think it's like, it's not just because you were like one of the housewives, you think it was also that really your new career is what got you this job. It sounds like. Yeah. And I, I keep earning it because, you know, ABC doesn't just throw you know, uh, I know that some of the criticism that has come back is that, you know, they're using me to sensationalize the topic. Um, and that's why I'm in it sprinkled throughout or whatever, but you know, uh, they don't really need to use me for that. You know, that it's, it's like, there's way better people to use. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, I think they, they really genuinely use me because they see that I've done the work. I know the topic and I've usually, uh, done something in each of these shows topics that was unique. So in the first one, as I mentioned, I had covered it first, really the Erica Jane Girardi thing. And I broke a lot of stuff on that story, uh, including the divorce. In this one, I was the first person before Jen got indict indicted to cover that Jen was involved in these types of uh, companies that were doing, that were investigated on this front. And I actually posted proof of it before it was deleted by Jen on my Instagram. And because I had done that, you know, journal, journalistic, if you will, uh, deep dive, and I will call it that, um, you know, I earned, I earned some 
kind of points with ABC, like you deserve to be here with everybody else because of that. And I think that's why they put it in the show. I would agree with all of that. Now, let's get into the meat and potatoes since this is your life's work. Are you shocked that Jen has pleaded not guilty? Let's start with that. Um, no, I think everybody has to plead not guilty initially before they, you know, to come up with their strategy in the US, in our particular justice system. What do you mean? Well, in our justice system, if you were to say, come out guilty right out of the hatch and say, I'm guilty, (laughs) then you would go directly into sentencing and you would get, let's say, the worst of the sentencing guidelines. Um, If you come in and you say you're not guilty, then it gives you some time to put together the strongest case possible so that the prosecutor might do a plea deal with you because their, your case may be stronger than they thought, even though they think they can still win. Um, uh, it also may mean that you can win, right? Um, right. That you, That's you true. get, yeah, you get your evidence together and you're like, wait a minute, they did this on a, cause there's so many ways to attack a case, right? You attack it technically with evidence, with witnesses, with, you know, they may pick the wrong um, defense, Right. And that that's all it takes. It's it's very uh, perceptive law. That is true. Now, in being a part of this documentary, did you learn anything? I mean, you were there. So did you learn anything from being a part of this documentary? Um, I, I, I knew so much of it, it, it like it, this documentary. Um, I, I wrote, what shocked me, what fact shocked me? There was, I hadn't heard direct testimony from victims that were affected by companies that Jen's uh, alleged scam took place in. So I, I hadn't heard from the victims. That was, that was very educational and shocking. And I know uh, that must have been difficult for ABC to pull together. Uh, that was where the real sweat of the show probably was um i was just like you think like just the victims like who really wants to speak on camera yeah i think some people were feeling intimidated to talk against jen for whatever reason uh i think that uh the prosecutor probably wasn't supportive of victims speaking before a trial with abc publicly um Mm, and i think yeah and i think the victims um who I think the victims who did speak, um, you know, they probably had to hunt down and, you know, and, and, and also find people willing to talk on camera. That's all true. Right. So, I mean, I have to say that's like, for me, the sense, like when I watched it, you know, cause it, the victims don't come right away. I have to say that is I feel as bad for these victims as I did for Erica's, you know, like when there's that one woman, I mean, of course, knowing how it all works, I do, I don't know if laugh is the right word, but I mean, they do make sure to get the woman's wheelchair in it. Like, I'm like, oh my God, I feel so bad for this. Like you really feel bad for all three of those people that they featured, right? Well, you, I mean, let's, let's talk uh, about the way uh, lawyers position things, right? So Jay Edelson, I brought this up on my live. He immediately picked the, the tagline in a sense of, uh, and I do mean that respectfully, what I'm about to say, orphans and widows. Why? Because that immediately gets you to understand what those victims are and put them in a really sad position in your head very quickly. Okay. So do I think ABC visually uh, also might do something like that? And I don't know. I've certainly never been told that, but I'm, I'm certain that uh, they wanted to present these victims so that, you know, you really could feel what they went through. You, that's when it hit home to me. Like, it's just. Yeah, you you don't have a computer and someone selling you a website. I mean, there is a certain ethic 
that we even in a capitalist society where you go, okay, the person's 80, they don't know how to use a laptop, they're not going to be able to do a web business. And of course, you know, you don't sell them the website, there is a certain, you know, component that you have to use judgment, even in a sales situation, certainly, but the sound bites that they put in the show, where you hear the kibachi guy, like, talking about how to get the most out of their credit card with it oh under the God. radar. Yes. I mean, you know, like, that was shocking. That was shocking. Or he's like, just do like, right. 15 and call it a day. I'm like, Oh my God, that's so bad. When it showed you, how dark it was. It showed how dark it was. It's dark. So when you film this, like you don't meet, like you don't meet the victims. You didn't meet the other people like Brian Moylan, who I had on the show. Like you're just alone doing your part, right? Yeah, I love Brian. Brian lives in England. So he must have flown to New York for it, I guess. Or maybe they shot him in England using a huh. a thing. I don't know. But uh, yeah, no, we're all at last. I know Housewife and the Hustler, they did a New York shoot, an LA shoot and my shoot. I don't know where else they went. So that like already I know in this one, I think they did. They definitely did Miami, me and New York, a bunch of people. And I don't know if they did anyone in L.A. Well, you're not shocked that Jen pleaded guilty because you think that that is the smart thing and that buys you more time and then you could plead. But I mean, do you think she's guilty? I mean, I would say that uh, I'm not. I, I'm not privy to all the evidence. However, as I stated earlier, in my life, I think that, uh, you know, she has a, a, a mountain to climb on this one. And the reason she has a mountain to climb, just talking uh, more from a, you know, cause I'm not, again, I'm not privy to all her defense and all the evidence, but, you know, having Stuart Smith uh, do a plea deal where he is now going to say that the testimony he gave to the FTC was false, which means, that that was something Jen was relying on in her defense, and that is now gone. Um, that's really damaging to Jen Shaw's defense, at least what it was. Um, I think, you know, not having the same amount of money, unfortunately, in our country, unlike other countries, for your foreign listeners who might be aware of this, like we do not have, uh, you know, a balanced system in the sense that the the prosecution has the same budget as the defense. You're, you know, so I don't think Jen has the unlimited budget that the New York prosecutor's office has in, in presenting a case on the day. Um, no, probably not. Yeah. And there, I mean, make no mistake, New York is like the Harvard of the prosecutor office. So she's up against some of the best lawyers in the country. Um, and then you add to it that she's uh, trying to defend on a white collar crime, which jurors already struggle to understand complex topics in white collar crime. And that means you have to bring in expensive experts to educate them. And frankly, I don't believe that Jen is going to have the budget for that in this particular case. There is benefit to doing that, but I don't see her having that kind of money. Plus those kind of experts are really difficult to find. Um, and so uh, those are the things that really scream out as, you know, uh, tough for her to, um, but I will say this, the defense is going to um, show that she was at arm's length on all of these, uh, giving these leads over to these companies, I'm sure. And, you know, it's going to be the burden is supposed to be on the prosecution to prove that, no, she actually knew what was happening in these organizations, either because she was, you know, in them, uh, even though she's claiming she wasn't, uh, or she, you know, supplied communication or manuals or whatever that helped them sell or shared in the commissions and got paid based on, you know, information that these were elderly people that were vulnerable. Right. Like that's even what they said during like the hus uh, the housewife and the Shaw shocker. Right. That her argument's going to be like, I gave leads, period. Like, I didn't realize you were saying things that weren't true. Like, I just gave you the leads. That's her. That's her. I think that's the crux of her case. Right. 
Yes, but unfortunately, also, Jen, the other people in this case, if you recall, they mentioned a narcotics arrest that triggered uh, the kibachi. I would say it like kibachi, but it's, <laughs> uh, yeah, that case, they already, I think, you know, they successfully indicted five people either through plea deals or jury trials and sentenced them. And those were people that were all partaking in the telemarketing aspect of the scam that Jen is somehow connected to. So we've got quite a few. Were those people claiming the same thing? Like, oh, I just handed over leads or no, they were actually doing the work. They were doing different aspects of the work. That's why Jen is in a way they're positioning Jen as like the mastermind. So they're they saying are. like they Jen, really yeah, Jen and Stuart Smith um, were like the, the sort of the, the brains of the operation in the sense that they supplied the leads of vulnerable people on purpose. And then they told these people what to sell to them, when and how, and they then benefited from it. And these people were just con- like the hands for the brain in a way. Do you think that because you like to like ride the fence here. Do you think that, and it's just your opinion, do you think that, what's the word? What am I trying to say? Like, do you think that Jen Shaw, because there is an argument, like, do you think she knew if she was doing this? Like, do you think she knew that this was illegal? I have spoken to lawyers that say the psychology sometimes of white collar criminals is that, they truly think that they are brilliant business people. They think they are Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank, Bethany Frankel from Skinny Girl, you know, Elon Musk. They think that they have figured out a way to make tons of money legally. Or do you, you know, do you think that Jen was that? Or do you think she knew? Like, look, this isn't uh, exactly kosher. Well, I'd say this. Um... You're, there absolutely is an argument that, you know, there's at this point, you know, I've got millions of laws, right? <laughs> Rules and laws, and some are federal and some are state and some are regulatory and some are, and, you know, certainly I don't think the founding fathers of our country sort of perceived all of the layers of laws and regulations and everything that exists today. And I'm sure that a lot of them, you know, there's, you know, a lot of our, uh, uh, you know, uh, Yeah, you know, best inventors, let's say, uh, would have been arrested. Okay, <laughs> they would have been like Theranos. All right, um, I just, I, I think that in this particular case, because it is a case by case basis, I think in this particular case, what's not helping then is the concealment. So what the government has basically alluded to is that she was aware that the FTC had met with her and interviewed her and told her that there were things that were going down that were wrong, and she continued to do it, and she even continued to do it in a way to conceal it, moving smaller amounts of money so it wouldn't be on the radar, using gadgets like burner phones and you know, allegedly and allegedly like, you know, I don't know, programs that like, you know, are encrypted and going to a huge level, which implies, of course, always concealment implies that, you know, you know, you're doing something wrong. And a lot of people don't make that association. What happened? So they've contacted her in the past to stop or what? I'm confused now. Okay, so there was an FTC investigation and Jen Shaw was interviewed and so was Stuart Smith. Like way so back when? 2016. Okay. She's also been aware of other companies, of course, that she's been involved with that had similar investigations. And just because the FTC interviews you doesn't mean that you're doing something criminal, but it's certainly a red flag to be careful, not be careful concealment wise, be careful, like you're, you maybe need to fix your business or you maybe need to stop doing your business. Okay. (laughs) Um, And some cases they'll shut you down. You know, they'll just say like, you know, we can't go criminal, but we're shutting you down. 
You guys need to listen to Andy Ware's Project Hail Mary on Audible. This interstellar science-based thriller from the best-selling author of The Martian is skillfully performed by Ray Porter. Ray brings this already gripping tale to life with his vibrant and witty narration. A lone astronaut must save the Earth from disaster in this epic tale of discovery, speculation, and survival that's part scientific mystery, part intergalactic journey, and all edge of your seat entertainment. And isn't that what you guys love? Edge of your seat entertainment? Isn't that why you're listening to this podcast? This Audible Studios production of Project Hail Mary is a number one New York Times audio bestseller and continues to top Audible's bestseller charts and garner rave listener reviews. That's so impressive. Here are what listeners are calling the highest order of geekasm metal. Go to audible.com slash project Hail Mary and listen now. You know, protein powders can feel so intimidating, this whole no pain, no gain. But the truth is deep down, we all need protein, whether it's about muscles and working out and doing reps or just taking a nice leisurely stroll. That's where essential protein from Ritual comes in. I love the fact that it's a great vanilla taste and there's no sugar added, no fillers, no colors, no shady additives, and it's soy-free, gluten-free, and formulated with non-GMO ingredients. I found Ritual so easy to use. You just add water, shake, and sip. And I love it. It comes in three premium formulations for different stages in life. And listen, we all have different unique nutrient needs. So why not shake up your Ritual? To make trying something new less scary, Ritual offers a money-back guarantee if you're not 100% in love. It's a money-back guarantee, guys. Plus, my listeners get 10% off during your first three months. Just visit ritual.com slash velvet to add essential protein today. That's ritual.com slash velvet. I've gained the COVID-19 over the past two years, and I've literally tried everything to take the weight off, and nothing has worked. Everything has been a fad or a gimmick until now. Calibrate is not a diet or a quick fix product. That's why it's worked for me. It's a year-long commitment that gives you the tools to fight your biology. It's different because it's a comprehensive doctor-guided metabolic reset that promotes sustainable results through lifestyle changes. Your medical team includes doctors who assess your health in an initial 45-minute video visit, provide ongoing medical support, and prescribe GLB-1s as part of your one-year metabolic reset. Calibrate's earliest members lost an average of 14% of their body weight, which is so unbelievable to me. Your weight doesn't reflect your willpower. Get back in control with Calibrate. Get $50 off the one-year metabolic reset when you use promo code VELVET at jointcalibrate.com. That's $50 off when you use code VELVET at jointcalibrate.com. The holiday shopping season is completely overwhelming. What to get? Mom, dad, your sister, your best friends, cousins, neighbors, dog. That's why I went to Raycon and got the one gift that everyone can use. Raycon wireless earbuds. Raycon wireless earbuds are all that I use now to record this podcast. The audio quality is so good. I love the fact that they're available in five stylish colors and with free shipping and returns, gifting them is easier than ever. The holidays are coming up faster than you think. Now is the time to knock out that gift list and avoid the last minute shipping scramble, especially because right now my listeners, that's you guys, will get 15% off site wide with code holiday at buyraycon.com slash velvet. Go to buyraycon.com slash velvet and use code holiday today to get 15% off your entire Raycon order buyraycon.com slash velvet and get 15% off site wide. With the holidays just around the corner, there's no better gift for your friends and family than skylight frames. So many of my really good friends have left New York and it's so hard to see them face to face. That's why I chose to get them skylight frames this holiday season. Skylight frame is a photo frame that you can update instantly by email from anywhere. It sets up effortlessly in under 60 seconds. So even if you're technologically challenged, it's so easy. You just plug it in, use the touch screen to connect to your wireless network and enjoy. Everyone in your family and all of your friends can just email pictures to your personal Skylight email address. It's 100% satisfaction guaranteed. If you don't love your Skylight, they'll offer you a full refund. Now, as a special offer, you can get $10 off your purchase 
purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com and enter code VELVET. That's right. To get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame, just go to skylightframe.com and enter code VELVET. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E.com, promo code VELVET. If you've ever dreamed of having the chance to win awesome prizes like a trip to Japan worth $40,000, dream houses in LA, Miami, and Austin, Texas, then you have to check out Omaze, the new way to give back to charity and have fun while doing it. Here's how Omaze works. You enter for the chance to win something amazing, and at the same time, you can donate to support great causes. And it's a way for nonprofits to raise money and for you to win big prizes, like the multi-million dollar house in Miami. You really got to check out this house. It has seven bedrooms, six bathrooms, and looks like a freaking resort. Go to amaze.com slash velvet robe and select the Miami dream house or a different experience of your choosing. Once you've selected your prize, choose a donation amount from $10 to 150. The more you donate, the more entries you'll get. Enter today for your chance to win the Miami dream house or other life-changing prizes and experiences at amaze.com slash velvet robe. Plus receive 20 extra entries when you enter Enter the code VELVETROPE20. That's O M A Z E dot com slash velvet rope. Enter the code VELVETROPE20 to receive 20 extra entries. So, um, what happened was there were, I guess, uh, allegedly, you know, several warning signs like these types of interviews. And after that, Jen's behavior change, not for the better, meaning like, oh, listen, maybe we should expand our lead list to not include elderly people. Maybe we should be careful that we tone down the sales language and don't say things like you'll make $10,000 a month when we have no idea what you're going to make. Maybe we should ask someone's technical expertise before selling them a website. You know, these types of responsible changes. She instead said, Let's move small amounts of money. Let's move it out of the country and back in again. Let's set up 42 companies. That, that's all speculative and alleged and, you know, me pretending, but you get the drift. So basically she doubled down, right? Like if you get investigated, you kind of, I mean, wouldn't you ask questions? Like, let's just play this out. Like if you're just running a business and people come and knock on your door and they're like, what you're doing, you know, is not okay wouldn't you be like, holy shit, I better fucking disband this business tonight? Not so much with Jen, Sean. I do have a, uh, an argument on her behalf, um, although I don't know if it would stand in, you know, to a jury. But yeah, it, and what is that? It would, it would appear that Jen Shaw, for, since she was very, very young, uh, has been working for companies that have done these types of practices. So companies that have done boiler room type environments, companies that have done, you know, uh, unrealistic, you know, selling. Um, I, I, as I mentioned, I'm tired, so I'm, I'm forgetting the, the proper vocab word for it. But basically, you know, misrepresenting, you know, what they really can guarantee the product will do or you'll get from the product. Right. And she's got a history of doing this since she's young. In fact, before I found, of course, that she was director of business development for Prosper Inc., which was investigated related to Trump University, which, if you guys don't know, was uh, selling uh, courses that basically said like you could get rich was you know uh, quickly by taking these kind of conferences and learning the real estate business. It had. It only branded Trump's name. It had nothing to do with Trump. It's just the like branding of the product line that they licensed. And what happened was people bought these like one day seminars for $1,500 and they bought these uh, one week seminars for $30,000. And at the end of the day, they ended up really no much, not much smarter, not able to make all the money that they promised. And in fact, People at Prosper Inc., you know, they pressure upsailed and they also they they were called a boiler room by NBC, I think it was. And um, and so those people, uh, they ended up taking out loans, sound familiar, and putting a whole bunch of money on their credit card and <laughs> all these things. Well, you know, Jen had worked at that company for like seven years and she actually left in 2011 
Um, and that's when they were really hardcore investigating and they eventually shut down that company. I don't know if there were arrests made uh, related to that company, but they definitely shut it down. Before that, Jen Shaw worked, uh, she said on Heather Gay's podcast that she had worked for another gentleman who uh, was involved in a similar type of scenario as this. And he sold, um, he was famous for selling books that like you could buy real estate with zero down and problems and become a millionaire right. overnight. And he also uh, ended up getting uh, tons of better business bureau complaints of people um, saying that, you know, they, they couldn't get their money back and they didn't want the product. And she worked there too. <laughs> Meaning like, okay, we're not necessarily taking her side. You're just saying like, that's an argument that this is all she knew. Right. So in other words, she comes out of college, she works for Carlton Sheets, and that's what that guy does. That's the gentleman I just mentioned. Okay. Right. Um, and he had hundreds of better business bureau uh, complaints. Okay. And, and he was into the same kind of, you know, scandalous selling and over promising. And again, educational courses. Hello. Then she moves on to, you know, some in-between jobs that are all related to people she knows in that business. Then she goes on to the next one. She's in Prosper. She's director of business development for Prosper Inc. That means that she's doing all of their big sales deals. You know, she's trying to get them bulk sales on these, you know, educational programs. Again, right. education, again, boiler room, again. Then she moves on to that and you know, she has more of the same type of experience, which is covered on the ABC show. I want people to still watch it. And then, you know, uh, we find her now in her own, you know, the multiple companies and she's indicted for this. That is, I mean, I, I get your argument and I'm not arguing, I'm just playing devil's advocate, but the only problem I have with that argument is when the people are indicted and they're taken away, or investigated, isn't that your like, okay, this is all I know, but all I know is not legal. I, I would say yes, except we know that that can't possibly be true because look at multi-level marketing and how many companies there have problems that, you know, people think that they're doing everything properly and, you know, they're not, they're doing a Ponzi scheme or a pyramid scheme or, you know, it, you know, so I, I, now, do I think Jen knew better, you know, after that whole argument, I should like be her defense lawyer. <laughs> do I right. think she, do, do, do you yeah. think she knew better? Yeah, I do think she knew better. I, I don't know if she always knew better, but I do think at a certain point she did. But then I think she was in too deep and she didn't know how to do anything else. And she derived a lot of her identity from the wealth that she created from you know, this business that she was doing. And she just, you know, I think she just didn't, then she may have done the rationalization and, but you know, the concealment at the end of the day is never going to convince a jury that she thought it was okay, truly. No. And I mean, listen, yeah, no. So that, that's right. why prosecutors always go for that. A lot of people don't get that. People, prosecutors look, for concealment so that they can prove you knew better. That makes sense. I mean, if you're concealing something, why would you conceal it if you thought it was fine? Exactly. And, and Jen concealed this? Allegedly, Jen sent messages that she wanted to have deleted. You know, she could argue that she did that for a different reason. Right. Remember, that's what the trial's about, right? And in um, the documentary, um, The Housewife and the Shaw Shocker. Apparently, I love saying that. Um, I love that you love saying it because then maybe people will watch it and they'll then let us do another one. And maybe I could do three for three. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> yeah, and like get me involved in the next one. I've After watching this one, I've decided I think I'm ready. I don't think it'll be a conflict of interest with Bravo. Oh my gosh, I'd love it. I actually would, you know, why don't you ask me the question, which is if out of all the housewives, who would I do the next one on? Well, that is, <laughs> that is the question I was going to ask. I mean, I think I know the answer, but I don't want to. You're like you. my brother. So, you know, <laughs> you know, my mind. I mean, no, no, no. That was on my <laughs> list of questions. Um, we're going to, okay. Table that for a second. I have, cause that question we're getting to, um, 
Right, right. So, I mean, in apparently, according to this documentary, Jen and Stuart, like, sent encrypted texts. I don't even know how you do that, but. Yeah, there's some, I, I forget. They they actually cited the application. I, I think it's like Telegram or. Wow. Yeah, something like that. I can't yeah. remember. Yeah. Interesting. So, it's, it was in the documentation. It was in like the, one of the prosecutor's responses of something. So you are kind of on the fence, but you're kind of saying that you think that Jen allegedly knew better and knew that this was not appropriate. So let's go with that for a minute. So, I mean, why? I mean, again, we go back to like, is it just that is how the world works? Like, again, I say the same thing I've always said. I want as much money as possible. I am like Kevin O'Leary, who I had on the show from Shark Tank. I love money. It is not a dirty thing for me to say. I fucking love money. I love health the most. <laughs> no, I do. My health, health first, health first. And once everybody in my life is healthy, I fucking want money and I want every fucking penny I can get my hands on because I love money. And there, I said it. I will not do something illegal ever. So what goes you're, through Well, you're your also mind? attorney. You're an attorney. I'm an attorney. So you yes. have a layer of, because uh, we're talking about white collar here. So as an attorney, you, you would never do that because you have a few things going for you. Number one, you know the law. Number two, you know the consequences of the law. And number three, you know the penalty of the law, uh, even further than the consequences that are initial. So like you go to a, a like a, a if you went into a, a bat, like a, a poor part of New York and you talk to, you know, young people there, they have no idea the law, a lot of them, and they don't also know the consequences. A lot of them don't know, like, you know, if you steal a bubble gum and you get a felony charge, you can never get a job again. You can never qualify for social welfare. You can never vote. You're socially, you're civilly dead. Your life yes. is over before it even began. You're already on the outside of society and you have no hope of ever getting back in. And that's how we make it. Your and letter, so if, you're, you're like, you have the scarlet letter from an early age. That's it. And those kids don't know that and they didn't understand it. And they never, you know, like, so I, you know, I, I do think education's really important. I mean, you know, I always try to put I tell the gossip and all this stuff, but I always try to give everybody some additional insight into things um, because a lot of people tune out our justice department and they tune out our, how our system works. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I did a whole show on the podcast with a prison worker uh, and she openly was saying on the show that the women are raped by the guards openly. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't shock me. But I mean, it, it shouldn't happen, no, right? Because who's not. the criminal? Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, what I, happens there? It's real. I mean, the guard is raping people in the prison and they're, you know. Well, and I'm not even trying to be funny at all, but like on, that's what happened on Orange is the New Black, which really is, they it was a great Gen G Colin, like they researched it to be as real as possible. So that happens, yeah. Really? Yeah. It was shocking to me though, to hear that it was that, you know, that you could talk about it that openly. Sorry, yeah. my dry, my dryer's going off. <laughs> no, that's so, I mean, it just, it's just that it's so strange to me. It's like, I get it. You just the greed, right? I mean, you could look at Jen Cha if she is guilty of this, what, what is the, wh there's no rationale behind this other than greed, right? I mean, what is the motivation for this other than money and greed, right? I mean, um, I'm willing to listen to another one. I think that's, you know, that sounds like the show a little bit, <laughs> you know, greed, American greed or whatever. Um, I don't know. I think probably in her situation, I would imagine that it maybe became about the lifestyle and the money because of the show, but I'm, I, I would say probably before that it, it came from a desire to be credible and to be respected and admired in her community, considering the fact that uh, she was made fun of in school for being of a different race and told to wash her face until the color of her skin changed. I'd say that 
she probably wanted to belong and money was a way to do it in a sense. So I'm going to be more, uh, I think, empathetic than just saying greed. You really are being empathetic. Yeah, that, I, mean, I have nothing else to say about that. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> well, no, well I mean, that never happens, David. You well, were speechless. No, I already. mean, like... <laughs> We all have childhood issues. I mean, people beat the shit out of me and I'm not. And you're still recovering from your Dorit. No, I am not. <laughs> I am like, I like, you have to like, I don't know, playing a victim. Like I don't support a victim mentality in society. That's just me. That's just my opinion. I just don't. I do if you're going through it yesterday, but I feel like, you got to work on your shit and get over it. Like life, we all have shit. Shit happens, man. Well, and I'm sure that's, I mean, you know, like but we're there's all a getting lot of- over things. Like you earn money and go spend money at Louie. Go have your, you know, I mean, that's a whole bigger issue. Like if money is your drug and you're trying to cover up some hole in you, go to therapy. I listen, I, I hear what you're saying, but that's not always what happens, unfortunately. And, you know, I get, you know, uh, I get that sensation. I've had a lot of really tragic events happen to me when I was young and I, you know, didn't walk around with a chip on my shoulder about them. But at the same time, I get how someone could, you know, it was a choice for me. It was obviously a choice for you. I'm sure your life hasn't been a a bowl of cherries with no nuts (laughs) or pits. No, you know, so it's a choice. It's a choice, but I'd say you're, you're what you said. I love money. I love, you know, money, health first, and then money. Yeah. There's something, there's something in that. Why, why do you love it? Is my question to you, David. Why do I love money? Because you personally, me personally, I love money. Really. I agree. I hate to quote him again, but Mr. O'Leary from Shark Tank, who was on this very podcast said it best money equals freedom. It allows you to say, fuck you. I will not do what you want. I will do what I want. It allows you to live your life authentically and do what you want on a daily basis. That is truly the bottom line of what money does. And then, I mean, I also do like nice things, but really at the root of it, it allows you to just be able to say, I don't want to do that. I'm doing what I want in life. I don't want to do that. I'm going to do like it allows you to just it's freedom. Really. That's if you think about it. It is freedom. No right. money, and- no problems. Absolutely. But it's it's freedom. Right. You associate it with freedom in your case and this Shark Tank guy. But what's interesting Mr. about O'Leary that Mr. O'Leary to you. Mr. O'Leary, okay. Um what is interesting about that and, you know, maybe is the the thing to ponder is, you know, why is freedom important to you in being in what you do? Like, did you have to work really hard and feel strapped to something most of your life or? Well, I mean, we all work hard. I'm still working hard, but I mean, I, I get what you're saying, but I mean, that's what it is. And it also, I mean, I, I like nice things. Sorry. I like nice things, but I would never. And I don't think money is as important to everyone. I definitely think people have different relations to money, but I mean, what I earn is what I earn. Like I would never say, oh, wait, if I just do this, I could have a little bit more. And like, if it's just a little bit, like maybe nobody's looking. That is, I would never, yeah, maybe it's because I know the consequences. That's what it is, I guess. But that is a personality type that you like when Carol Raswell was on my show, she had an interesting theory that the type of person who is in the mix for housewives already has a daring sense to them, which I agree with this. You don't go through, listen, you were on the housewives. You don't just get cast. You it's a certain daring, not there's hundreds of millions of people that would never want to be on TV or put their life out there. You do have to have a daring side to you to begin with. Yeah. Right? She said a risk taker. Right. I listened to your interview. It was good. Thank you. You're part welcome. Two, part two is out <laughs> now. So listen to part two, but 
you know, because I don't think you listen to part two, which is okay. Better. I'm on that. I'm going to listen to part two right now after this. Okay. <laughs> but she had a good point and it is true. It's like, and it's so it's like, if you're already have that like risk taking gene, which does get you on housewives, I, you're more likely to do something like this. I, I do agree. I mean, it's not the majority, but I do agree that you are a risk taker. I, I'm a risk taker in life. I'm an entrepreneur, but not when it comes to illegal stuff. I just think it catches up to you no matter what. So that's where it's like, it comes back to just greed. Like, I don't think you could say, you know, you had to wash your face until it wasn't dirty and people made fun of you because you were different. I don't know. Like that doesn't, that leads to other issues. It doesn't need, I mean, I, I get it. You want a ton of money to prove to people that you're worthy, but all right, get a good shrink. That's just, well, my- I mean, I'm going to just say that a lot of things that I was pitched were nice things that were very expensive ended up not being that nice. I'm just saying. So if you really, and the From more rich you, past life, you mean, no, just like when I was wealthy and I could have anything, I bought a bunch of things and all the things that I had were flawed. A lot of them. I can tell you some, if you'd like, would you like tell me, me to tell you some? Well, okay. Do. Was it the 25 thousands? Okay. No, <laughs> no, those were, those were just leave those alone. They're in <laughs> perfect. <laughs> I mean, if um, those are flawed, I'm going to demand my, they're money not flawed. <laughs> I mean, I have flawless. a picture with them member. So go on. I know. Um, no, like for example, Louis Vuitton, uh, suitcases are very heavy. Okay. And they're hard to close. The zipper doesn't close well. And they also get dirty in the light part of the leather, which is annoying. And so really, truly from the perspective of a nice suitcase, there's some things that I would like to see, like the leather could be softer, like be good if there wasn't any light leather. And I'd like the zipper to work right. Okay. I'm not sure anyone is crying a river for you based on that. No, but that's the point is this. You're saying I want nice things, but I'm trying to say that a lot of things that were pitched that are nice are actually more flawed than regular things. Like, so I'm not totally buying in a sense because I I love like this philosophical conversation. We should probably take this after the show because you and I could talk forever. But I feel like, you know, a lot of reason that people buy quote unquote nice things is really not because they're necessarily a better craftsmanship than other things. They're status things. And that means that you're filling some sort of thing. And I know this because I did it because I can't speak from, I mean, how could I, how could I say it if I didn't already do it? (laughs) <laughs> you know, so I recognize it. No, I get it. I mean, you know, I don't necessarily buy Louis just, I mean, it is so pretty though. Oh my God. It's so pretty. Okay. <laughs> I get I what you. you're saying. Now, do you, how do you, cause you've researched both of them. How do you think Jen's situation compares to Erica's worse, better, more egregious? talk to me uh it's worse worse because she's facing seven to ten years in prison and erica hasn't been indicted yet it, uh you know and it doesn't look like it's going to happen although you know we still have some road on that because of, of course you know if they are indeed doing an investigation out of illinois criminally i mean you know th- the government does <laughs> deep dives that civil litigations and bankruptcy courts can't even do Yes. Yes. And yes. I think that's why it is worse. What about, what have you learned from this with Sharif? Like, do you think Sharif knew what was going on? As we continue this conversation with Dana next time, we're not just going to keep talking about Jen Shaw and the housewife and the Shaw shocker. We're going to talk about what is going on with Dana in the real world with Teddy and Dorit and PK, you know, Teddy blamed Dana for Dorit's home invasion. I don't know if you guys know all of this, but Dana posted something online and PK and Teddy blamed uh, Dana about Dorit's home invasion. So we're about to get into all of that and what's going on with her and Teddy. They're in this little feud. We've got a lot more to cover. Stay tuned for part two of our chat with Miss Dana Wilkie. Thanks for listening to yet another episode of Behind the Velvet Rope. Because without you listeners, I would just be a crazy person with voices in my head. And if you like what you hear, 
subscribe, subscribe, subscribe on Apple Podcasts under Behind the Velvet Rope. And when you're done subscribing, feel free to leave a five-star write-up review because the write-up reviews actually count. We read each and every one of them. We post the best ones and the reviews really help our shows keep going. And we really appreciate everything you guys say, especially the positive ones. And if you want to find us online, we're at Behind Velvet Rope on Instagram. We are at David Yontef on Instagram. We're behind the Velvet Rope on Apple Podcasts. Or head on over to Patreon because you know what? There are just some things we can't talk about here. So for our bonus episodes, go to Patreon and type in Behind the Velvet Rope. And if you still aren't sick of me and you want more David, go to Cameo and book me on Cameo. And you can ask me anything there. I'll answer whatever you want. And I have a bargain basement price of $10. Thank you guys. See you soon.